I'm joined now by Bob Chapek, Disney's CEO. Bob, thanks so much for talking to us this morning. Oh, appreciate it. Really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Julia. So, Bob, we've seen the video of Disneyland Shanghai opening. We've seen that it's operating at less than 30 percent capacity, but we've also seen that there's demand from your fans. Can you give us a sense of what bookings are looking like through the rest of the quarter and what you're expecting in terms of attendance at this park looking into next quarter? Well, Shanghai is what we call a short book market, where typically most of the tickets for that week are sold within the week. Uh, as you know, we're, as you mentioned, significantly constraining the amount of tickets that will sell, and we're pretty much booked out for the rest of the week. We have a few tickets available on certain days, but essentially everything's gone. This is really indicative, I think, of the love that consumers have for our brand across the world. I get countless number of emails and correspondence from guests saying how much they can't wait for us to open up because to them it represents some semblance of normal, maybe the new norm, but it's some semblance of normal. And uh, we certainly want to open up as soon as we can across the world, but we're going to do so in a responsible way. So um, we're excited for our guests. We're excited for our cast. We want to get our cast back to work as soon as possible. So this is a first step. It's a baby step and we're moving slowly, but uh, we're very encouraged by what we see in Shanghai. Now, in terms of what that new normal looks like, though, you're now operating at well less than 30 percent of uh, former capacity. How long is that sustainable just from a profitability standpoint? <clears throat> well, I look at this as a stair step. We're going to be very conservative. We're going to be very prudent. We're going to be very disciplined about how we open up. And then we're going to ramp up and increase. Right now, the government has a 30 percent cap of our typical capacity in terms of the number of uh, guests that we can put into Shanghai Disney. And so the plan is essentially to go up 5,000 a week just until we get to the point that we know that we can operate under our, uh, under our guidelines in a way that's very responsible. And uh, then when the government loosens up those constraints and restrictions, then we'll walk that ramp again, but slow and steady for us. But do you think reaching 100% capacity is even possible with social distancing and the idea of trying to keep six feet between people in the park? Well, we're going to see how it goes. Um, right now, a lot of that depends, uh, Julia, on the guest. And our guests have been extraordinarily uh, uh, diligent in terms of maintaining that social distancing so far. So a lot of it's got to do with guest behavior as much as it's got to do with Disney operations. So if the guest continues to behave in the way that they have, I think we might be able to approach that. So what does that mean for reopening the parks in Tokyo and Hong Kong? Do you expect guests to behave in the same way there? Uh, I, I think so. I think, you know, everybody across the world knows that this is a relatively uh, uh, important condition upon which we can continue to operate the parks. They all want to come back to the parks and everybody knows that COVID-19 is a serious matter. Therefore, we're all playing a part of this ecosystem of safety, if you will. And we're going to do our part, and we need our guests to do their part, too. So can you give us any sense of a timeline for even partially reopening the parks in Tokyo, Hong Kong, and then, of course, the parks here in the U.S.? I know you are opening um, the mall outside the park in Orlando, but does that mean that we will see Disney World open in July? Well, we're not going to comment on any specific date uh, to a certain extent and a large extent. It's going to depend upon, you know, guidance we get from the federal government, the state government, the local government, uh, healthcare experts, as well as, you know, f uh, the immediate hospitals that are in the area of uh, where we operate and what their capacities are. So uh, we're not going to comment on any specific timing, but I think it is a good sign that Disney Springs is going to open up in Orlando you know, we, we stuck our toe in the water, if you will, in Shanghai with Disney Town, and we operated that for about a month, and everything went extremely well. Once again, the guests really cooperated. Uh, our operations people were phenomenal, and we held to the standards that we set up. And hopefully we'll see that at Disney Springs as well, and uh, this will be the beginning of a great new rebirth uh, of Disney Parks. 
But what's going to be the hardest part for you to reopen the parks, especially the parks here in the U.S. that are such a meaningful piece of your revenue? Is it about getting the right cleaning processes in place? Is it about training uh, your visitors to get used to, to waiting in lines in a different way and not getting too close to each other? What's going to be the key thing that needs to be figured out for you to get those parks really up and operational again? Well, you know, along with social distancing, one of the things that we're likely going to require is masks for both the cast and the guest. And I think the masks for the guest will be something that culturally is, is different. In Asia, as you know, uh, it's fairly commonplace, even before COVID, for folks to walk around in public with masks on. That is not the case in the U.S. So that will be something that will be a little trying, I think, for some of the guests, particularly in the hot humid, uh, you know, summers that we tend to have. Yeah, absolutely. Now, shifting gears over to your movie studio, with all theatrical releases on hold until you release Mulan, which you delayed until mid-July, are you concerned that consumers are still going to be wary about going to movie theaters and that it'll make it very hard for that film to be profitable? Well, I think it's going to be a stair-step situation, just like it's going to be in our parks. I think there's a lot of pent-up demand, on the other hand, that uh, uh, viewers, uh, fans of movies want to go see. Uh, you know, typically, if you think about the occupancy of a movie theater, Monday through Friday afternoon, you know, 25% is about what you get if they were to open up, say, at 25%. And it really becomes only an issue on Friday night and Saturday night, and to a lesser extent on Sunday night. So it really doesn't push the limits of what would typically be seen as occupancy inside movie theaters until you get to those weekend evenings. And in that particular case, I think that could be managed. That's really going to be up to our exhibitors uh, that we partner with. So I don't think it's going to be as extreme as, as your hypothesis. But this is one of the very first wide release films that's going to be, be hitting the theater chains in July. Do you wish you had held out a little bit longer on that release? Well, we're optimistic. At Disney, we're a bunch of optimists. And uh, I think that that's a very good re release date for this particular title. Again, you have to balance uh, people's anxieties about going out in public with the pent-up demand, you know, whether you're talking, once again, about movie theaters or whether you're talking about theme parks. And as long as we can do so in a safe, uh, relatively safe, responsible way, I think that's going to be important for the exhibitors to consider all factors when they make their decisions to open up. Now, before you release Mulan, you are taking another one of your films that had been intended for movie theaters, Artemis Fowl, and you're releasing it on Disney Plus um, in June. Are you considering skipping theaters and sending other ones of your films direct to Disney Plus going forward? You know, we believe in the theatrical experience, particularly to launch big blockbuster franchise films. I mean, it fuels the entire Disney company from consumer products, products to theme parks, all the way to Disney Plus. And so we really think that that's the smart way to launch our big tentpole films. On the other hand, with the uh, luxury of having Disney Plus and its humongous success that it's had with 54 and a half million households across the world, we believe that that's also for certain films a very viable and important way to premiere films as well. And it will be on a very deliberate basis, a film by film by film basis that we make that decision. But there's not going to be any hard and fast rules. I think what this situation with COVID has taught us is that you need to remain flexible. You need to remain nimble and we will remain nimble. But uh, uh, we do believe in that theatrical window. Now, speaking of Disney Plus, you mentioned the 54 and a half million subscribers. You're well on your way to hitting the lower range of the 60 to 90 million subscribers that you forecast that you would hit by the end of September 2024. So we're talking about four years early there. Can you update your guidance on Disney Plus for us? We're not going to update guidance other than to say that we're thrilled with where we're at with Disney Plus. And as you know, we've got some launches coming uh, later on in the year. We've got, in June, we've got Japan. Uh, we've got some more European countries in September. And towards the end of the year, we're going to launch Latin America. So we're very bullish on Disney Plus and the growth of the number of households for the remainder of the year.
Now, both at Disney Plus and at your movie studio, you haven't been able to sh shoot any new productions, especially here in California. And I'm wondering at what point the, sh the stoppage of production of entertainment is really going to have an impact on the kind of content you're able to put on Disney Plus, um, as well as on your on your TV networks. Well, as you know, we have a certain amount of inventory that uh, uh, we've got, uh, particularly for Disney Plus, that is still fueling the machine. Uh, it's important to note, though, that pre-production, pre sort of the development phase, can still happen uh, during these times of uh, lockdown, if you will, and post-production can still happen. So it's only films that are midstream, right in the middle of production. Take, for example, Mandalorian. Mandalorian was shot before uh, uh, COVID really hit. And so we've been in post-production, and there will be no delay on Mandalorian. Same thing with Black Widow, which is coming out in November. Now, another huge piece of your business, of course, is the television business, your media networks division. ESPN is a huge part of that. Americans are suffering from the lack of live sports right now, and that is really dragging on ESPN's advertising revenue. How much do you expect ESPN and the lack of live sports to be a drag, not just on advertising, but also to be a driver of cord cutting going forward? Well, Julia, I think it's important to note that in the month of April, amongst adults 18 to 49 in prime time, we were up at ESPN by 11%. And I think that says something about the ingenuity of our uh, team over at ESPN. I think it says something about the brand and the wealth of assets that we have. To be in this situation with no live sports and have ratings go up 11% in prime time, I think that says something. It's the last dance, right? It's the uh, uh, WNBA draft. It's the NFL draft. We love live sports. Live sports are critical to ESPN. But would, we found a way. I talked about being nimble. ESPN's nimble. They found a way. So I think we'll be resilient. And what are you hearing from the heads of the different leagues about when we'll see games start up again, maybe without fans in the stands? Well, there's been countless number of discussions about different options and different plans from each of the leagues. I won't comment on any one specific because I'll let them do that. But we're working very, very closely with a variety of different scenarios uh, that will bring live sports uh, back to our fans at ESPN. Now, you mentioned your ratings are, are being sustained at ESPN by this sort of more innovative non-sports programming. But just in terms of advertising, we're hearing a lot about an advertising recession. Are you concerned big picture, looking across your networks, that we'll see ad dollars move away from television and shift more over to digital platforms like Facebook and Google due to this COVID-related recession? Well, there's no doubt we're going to feel the impact of, you know, the advertising hit, um, both at ABC and at ESPN, uh, probably more, more pronounced at ESPN than, than ABC. Long term, though, I'm not sure it's really going to be uh, uh, anything that's going to be, you know, shocking. I mean, there's certainly trends that are happening in the marketplace and those trends will follow. But I don't see this as a seismic shift at all in terms of where the ad market's going to go. Uh, you know, aside from, of course, the short term, which we know we're ex you know, experiencing right now. And just a final question, Bob, on leadership. You took this role of CEO at a time just sort of on the, the brink of Disney facing these unprecedented challenges. And Disney is really being hit hard um, by COVID and the ripple effects. Just wondering, you know, when you were appointed CEO, you were meant to run the day to day and your predecessor, Bob Iger, was meant to focus on content. How has that relationship worked out in the wake of this crisis? Well, this is an unprecedented situation. And as you recall, in our first conversation, we talked about disruption. Uh, I knew there would be disruption in my tenure as CEO. Uh, what I didn't realize would happen that fast, nor would it happen that profoundly. Uh, Bob is there as an advisor for me. Uh, we talk many times a day, uh, as we do with our entire senior team, because there's no playbook for this, right? There's no playbook for a worldwide pandemic that essentially shuts down most of the world and certainly uh, a big chunk of Disney. And so we've got a team approach. We're all on board. We're all working hard to figure out the right thing for our shareholders, figure out the right thing for our cast, and figure out the right thing for the guest. And Disney's a resilient company. We're going to be back, and we're going to be back stronger than ever. And uh, we've got great brand. We've got great franchises. We've got great storytellers. And uh, 
I, I think uh, we're going to come out of this just fine. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us this morning and keeping us posted um, on everything moving forward. Bob Tapak, CEO of Disney, thanks so much.